Good evening, monster children. I am Vinny Kami, the new proprietor of the Kaiju Crypt. Yeah, yeah, that's only because my cousin was framed. Yeah, you heard that right. Framed like a last known photo. I ain't taking that back either. Kappa Joe, your... Relatives' lascivious appreciation of human women's buttocks is well documented. Even the Monster Island legal action team was not foolish enough to defend him in court. Yeah, nah. You know what? Screw the board. Screw the board and their draconian decisions. The broken clock was right this time. Now please, attend to your butling duties, Mr. Joe. Give candy to the costumed children. Ah, yes, Master Kami, whatever. I'm on it. I'm on it. I gotta do everything <clears> around here. Halloween, hand To out quote one of my whatever. favorite you humans, yeah, darkness you. falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Creatures crawl in search of blood to terrorize y'all's neighborhood. <laughs> Halloween time for you mortals is a time when you can pretend to be your favorite monsters without consequence. But some creatures rampage because they are searching for a companion. As we shall see in tonight's story, The Foghorn, by the late great Ray Bradbury. This tale, which was originally published in the Saturday Evening Post in 1951, and reprinted in Bradbury's book The Golden Apples of the Sun, was an influence on Godzilla and Howl from Beyond the Fog. For this pillar of the kaiju genre. Our reader will be... Mr. Joe, who is our reader? Oh, um, well, he, uh, he, he, uh, he dropped out. Then find another one immediately. I already have. Sir. Who? Oh, you know, just another overworked yokai. <sighs> and now, monster children, enjoy this American kaiju classic. <laughs> uh, hello there. Is this thing on? I don't know how the hell to tell anymore with all these newfangled devices and stuff. They got plugged in. Oh, wait, no, the, that, that's a light. I, I think it's on. Uh, well, uh, hello there, everybody. Um, hey, uh, how's, it, how's it going? Uh, yeah, well, uh, ha happy Halloween, I suppose. Uh, I was just sort of pushed in here and told to, I was reading some sort of story or something, some sort of tale of terror, I suppose. Well, uh, I suppose we should probably get started then, shall we? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Honestly, it's probably gonna be fun. Uh, not just for you kitties out there, but for me too. I've always sort of fancied myself a thespian at heart, and, uh, well, I never really got around to pursuing my acting dreams because, well, about a handful of years ago, I wandered into this here building here, and, uh, well, I... I dropped all my beans, and I've been trying to find him ever since, and, uh, somehow or other that turned into a lucrative janitor job, and so I've been mopping up the place and cleaning up people's, uh, well, I've been cleaning up, I'll, I'll just say that, and, uh, I don't want to complain or anything, but there was this one time where it got partic- Oh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm supposed to be- I'm supposed to be reading some sort of story here, hang on, let me- let me see what I got here- Oh, the foghorn! We're going to be reading some Bradbury today. I actually met Ray Bradbury. Or was that Ray Harryhausen? Or was that uh, some other guy named Ray? I don't remember. It's been so long. You see, I'm just horribly old. And, uh, well, my memories tend to bleed together a little bit. But uh, I'm going to do my best here. I suppose you don't want to hear about any of that stuff anyway. You're here for a Halloween story, which means you want to get creeped out of your minds, and you want to hear tales of terror and about spooky monsters in the night and all that stuff right there, right? That's what you want to hear? That's why you're here, isn't it, you weirdos? Anyway, I should probably get started with this story. Uh, let me just get my 
get my spectacles on here. No, those aren't the right glasses. Hang on. Let me just, uh, hang on. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, folks. I, I got so many glasses. Uh, hang on. Let me just, uh, just short up. There we go. Spit, spit shine there a little bit. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's so much better. Oh, I can see the words so much better now. All right, here we go. Uh, well, I should probably put some kind of showmanship into this, I suppose. So, uh, uh, uh boils and ghouls. <laughs> yeah, I've always wanted to say that. Anyway, boils and ghouls, uh, you better settle in for the night. Uh, make sure your windows are all locked up and there ain't no monsters peeking in at you. And there might be anyway, so that, that's where the locking part comes in. Yeah, I'm, I'm rambling now, I suppose. I should probably get started, but here we go. Without any further ado or ramblings from yours truly, uh, here's The Foghorn by Ray Bradbury. Out there in the cold water, far from land, we waited every night for the coming of the fog. And it came, and we oiled the brash machinery and hit the fog light up in the stone tower. Feeling like two birds in the gray sky, McDunn and I sent the light touching out red, then white, then red again, to eye the lonely ships. And if they did not see our light, then there was always our voice, the great deep cry of our foghorn shuddering through the rags of mist, to startle the gulls away like decks of scattered cards, and make the waves turn high and foam. It's a lonely life, but you're used to it by now, aren't you? asked McDunn. Yes, I said. You're a good talker, thank the Lord. Well, it's your turn on land tomorrow, he said, smiling, to dance the ladies and drink gin. What do you think, McDunn, when I leave you out here alone? On the mysteries of the sea, McDunn lit his pipe. It was a quarter past seven of a cold November evening. The heat on, the light switching its tail in two directions, the foghorn mumbling in its high throat of the tower. There wasn't a town for a hundred miles down the coast, just a road, which came lonely through the dead country to the sea, with few cars on it, a stretch of two miles of cold water out to our cork, and rare few ships. The mysteries of the sea, said McDunn thoughtfully. You know, the ocean's the biggest damn snowflake ever. It rolls and swells a thousand shapes and colors, no two alike. Strange. One night years ago, I was here alone when all of the fish of the sea surfaced out of there. Something made them swim in and lie in the bay, sort of trembling and staring up at the tower light going red. White, red, white, across him, so I could see their funny eyes. I turned cold. They were like a big peacock's tail moving out there until the midnight. Then, without so much as a sound, they stepped away. The million of them was gone. I kind of think maybe in some sort of way they all came all those miles to worship. Strange, but think how the tower must look to them. Standing seventy feet tall above the water, the god light flashing out from it, and the tower declaring itself with a monster voice. They never came back, those fish, but don't you think for a while they thought they were in the presence? I shivered. I looked out at the long gray lawn of the sea, stretching away into nothing and nowhere. Oh, the sea's full, McDunn puffed his pipe nervously, blinking. He had been nervous all day and hadn't said why. For all our engines and so-called submarines, it'll be ten thousand centuries before we set foot on the real bottom of the sunken lands. In the fairy kingdoms there, and no real terror. Think of it. It's still the year three hundred thousand before Christ down under there, while we paraded around with trumpets lopping off each other's countries and heads. They've been living beneath the sea. Twelve miles deep and cold at a time as old as the beard on a comet. Yes, it's an old world. Come on, I've got something special I've been saving up to tell ye. We ascended the eighty steps, talking and taking our time. At the top, McDunn switched off the room light, so 
there'd be no reflection in the plate glass. The great eye of the light was humming, turning easily in its oiled socket. The foghorn was blowing steadily once every fifteen seconds. Sounds like an animal, don't it? McDunn nodded to himself. A big, lonely animal crying in the night, sitting here on the edge of ten million years, calling out to the deeps. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And the deeps do answer. Yes, they do. You've been here now for three months, Johnny, so I better prepare you. About this time of year, he said, studying the mark in the fog, something comes to visit the lighthouse. The swarms of fish, like you said. No, this is something else. I've been putting enough tin in you because you might think I'm daft, but tonight's the latest I can put it off, for if my calendar's marked right from last year, tonight's the night it comes. Now, I won't go into detail. You'll have to see it for yourself. Just sit down there. If you want, tomorrow you can pack your duffel and take the motorboat to land and get your car parked there at the Diggy Pier on the Cape and drive on back to some little Linden town and keep your lights burning nights. I won't question you or blame you. It's happened three years now, and it's the only time anyone's been here with me to verify it. You wait and watch. Half an hour passed with only a few whispers between us. When we grew tired waiting, McDonn began describing some of his ideas to me. He had some theories about the foghorn itself. One day, many years ago, a man walked along and stood in the sound of the ocean on a cold, sunless shore and said, We need a voice to call across the water to warn the ships. I'll make one. I'll make a voice that is like an empty bed beside you all night long, and like an empty house when you open the door, and like the trees in autumn when no leaves. A sound like the birds flying south crying, and a sound like November wind in the sea on a hard, cold shore. I'll make a sound that's so alone that no one can miss it, and whoever hears it will weep in their souls, and to all who hear it in the distant towns. I'll make me sound, and an apparatus, and I'll call it a foghorn, and whoever hears it will know the sadness of eternity and the briefness of life. The foghorn blew. I made up that story, said McDunn quietly, to try to explain why this thing keeps coming back to the lighthouse every year. The foghorn calls, I think. It comes. But, I said, Shh, said McDunn. There, he nodded, out to the deeps. Something was swimming toward the lighthouse tower. It was a cold night, as I said. The high tower was cold, and the light was coming and going, and the foghorn calling and calling through the revealing whist. You couldn't see far, and you couldn't see plain, but there was a deep sea moving on its way about the night earth, flat and quiet, to color of gray mud, and here were the two of us alone in the tower, and there far out at first was a ripple followed by a wave, a rising, a bubble, a bit of froth, and then, from the surface of the cold sea, came a head, a large head, dark-colored, with immense eyes, and then a neck, and then, not a body, but more neck, and more. The head rose a full forty feet above the water on a slender and beautiful neck. Only then did the body like a little island of black coral and shells and crayfish, drip up from the subterranean. There was a flicker of tail. In all, from the head to tip of tail, I estimated the monster at ninety or a hundred feet. I don't know what I said. I said something. Steady, boy, steady, whispered McDunn. It's impossible, I said. 
No, Johnny, we're impossible. It's like it always was ten million years ago. It hasn't changed. It's us in the land that have changed, become impossible. Us! It swam slowly and with a great majesty out into the icy waters, far away. The fog came and went with it, momentarily erasing its shape. One of the monster eyes caught and held and flashed back our immense light. Red, white, red, white. Like a disk held high and sending a message in primeval code. It was as silent as the fog through which it swam. It's a dinosaur of some sort. I crouched down, holding to the stair rail. Yes, one of the tribe. But they died out. No, only hid away in the deeps. Deep, deep, down in the deepest deeps. Isn't that a word now, Johnny? A real word? It says so much. The deeps. There's all the coldness and darkness and deepness in a world, in a word like that. What do we do? Do? We got our job. We can't leave. Besides, we're safer here than any boat trying to get to land. That thing's as big as a destroyer. It almost is swift. But here? Why does it come here? The next moment, I had me answer. The foghorn blew, and the monster answered. A cry came from across a million years of water and mist. A cry so anguished and alone, it shuddered in my head and my body. The monster cried out at the tower. The foghorn blew. The monster roared again. The foghorn blew. The monster opened its great toothed mouth, and the sound that came from it was the sound of the foghorn itself, lonely and vast and far away. The sound of isolation, of viewless sea, a cold night, a partness. That was the sound. Now, whispered McDunn, do you know why it comes here? I nodded. All year long, Johnny. That poor monster there, lying far out, a thousand miles at sea, and twenty miles deep, maybe, biding its time, perhaps a million years old, this one creature. Think of it. Waiting a million years. Could you wait that long? Maybe it's the last of its kind. I sort of think that's true. Anyway, here come men on land and build this lighthouse five years ago and set up their foghorn and sound it and sound it out toward the place where you bury yourself and sleep and see memories of a world where there were thousands like you. But now you're alone, all alone in a world that's not made for you. A world where you have to hide. But the sound of the fog horde comes and goes, comes and goes, and you stir from the muddy bottom of the deeps, and your eyes open like the lenses of two-foot cameras, and you move, slow, slow, for you have the ocean sea on your shoulders, heavy. But that fog horn comes through a thousand miles of water, faint, and familiar, and the furnace in your belly stokes up, and you begin to rise, slow, slow. You feed yourself on minnows, on rivers of jellyfish, and you rise slow, through the autumn months, through September, when the fog started, through October, with more fog and the horn still calling on you on. And then, late in November, after pressurizing yourself day by day, a few feet higher every hour, you are near the surface and still alive. You've got to go slow. If you surfaced all at once, you'd explode. 
so it takes you all of three months to surface and then a number of days to swim through the cold waters to the lighthouse and there you are out there in the night johnny the biggest damned monster in creation and here's the lighthouse calling to you with a long neck like your neck sticking way up out of the water and a body like your body and most important of all a voice like your voice do you understand now johnny do you understand the foghorn blew the monster answered i saw it all i knew it all the million years of waiting alone for someone to come back who never came back. The million years of isolation at the bottom of the sea, the insanity of time there, while the skies cleared of reptile birds, the swamps fried on their continental lands, the sloths and saber-tooths had their day and sank in tar pits, and men ran like white ants upon the hills. The fog horn blew. Last year, said McDunn, that creature swam round and round, round and round all night, not coming too near, puzzled, I'd say, afraid, maybe, and a bit angry after coming all this way, but the next day, unexpectedly, the fog lifted. The sun came out fresh, the sky was as blue as a painting, and the monster swam off away from the heat and the silence and didn't come back. I suppose it's been brooding on it for a year now, thinking it over, every which way. The monster was only a hundred yards off now, and the foghorn was crying at it. As the lights hit them, the monster's eyes were fire and ice, fire and ice. That's life for you, said McDunn. Someone's always waiting for someone who never comes home. Always someone loving something more than that thing loves them. And after a while you want to destroy whatever that thing is, so it can't hurt you no more. The monster was rushing at the lighthouse. The fog horn blew. Let's see what happens, said McDunn. He switched off the fog horn. The ensuing minute of silence was so intense that we could hear our hearts pounding in the glassed area of the tower, could hear the slow, grease turn of the light. The monster stopped and froze. Its great lantern eyes blinked. Its mouth gaped. It gave a sort of rumble like a volcano. It twitched its head this way and that as if to seek the sounds now dwindled off in the fog. It peered at the lighthouse. It rumbled again. Then its eyes caught fire. It reared up, threshed the water, and rushed at the tower, its eyes filled with angry torment. McDonough, I cried, switch on the horn! McDunn fumbled with the switch, but even as he switched it on, the monster was rearing up. I had a glimpse of its gigantic paws, fish skin glittering in webs against the finger-like projections, clawing at the tower. The huge eye on the right side of its anguished head glittered before me like a cauldron, into which I might drop, screaming. The tower shook. The foghorn cried. The monster cried, it seized the tower and dashed at the glass, which shattered upon us. McDunn seized my arm. Downstairs! The tower rocked, trembled, and started to give. The foghorn and the monster roared. We stumbled and fell, half down the stairs. Quick! We reached the bottom as the tower buckled down toward us. We ducked under the stairs in the small stone cellar. There were a thousand concussions as the rocks rained down. The foghorn stopped abruptly. The monster crashed upon the tower. The tower fell. We knelt together, McDunn and I, holding tight while our world exploded. Then it was over, and 
there was nothing but darkness in the wash of a sea on raw stones. That and the other sound. Listen, said McDon quietly. Listen. We waited a moment, and then I began to hear it. First a great vacuum sucking of air, and then the lament, the bewilderment, the loneliness of the great monster folded over upon us. Above us, so that the sickening reek of its body filled the air, a stone's thickness away from our cellar. The monster gasped and cried. The tower was gone. The light was gone. The thing that had called it across a million years was gone. And the monster was opening its mouth and sending out great sounds. The sounds of a foghorn again and again. The ships far at sea, not finding the light, not seeing anything, but passing and hearing late that night, must have thought, there it is, the lonely sound, the lonesome bayhorn, all's well, we've rounded the cape, and so it went for the rest of that night. The sun was hot and yellow, the next afternoon, when the rescuers came to dig us out from our stone under cellar. It fell apart, is all, said McDon gravely. We had a few bad knocks from the waves, and it just crumbled. He pinched my arm. There was nothing to see. The ocean was calm, the sky blue. The only thing was a great algaic sink from the green matter that covered the fallen tower stones and the shore rocks. Flies buzzed about. The ocean washed empty on the shore. The next year they built a new lighthouse, but by that time I had a job in the little town and a wife in a good small warm house that glowed yellow on autumn nights. The doors locked, and the chimney puffing smoke. As for McDunn, he was master of the new lighthouse, built to his own specifications, out of stone-reinforced concrete. Just in case, he said. The new lighthouse was ready in November. I drove down alone one evening late and parked my car and looked across the gray waters and listened to the new horn sounding once, twice, three, four times a minute, far out there by itself. The monster? It never came back. It's gone away, said McDunn. It's gone back to the deeps. It's learned. You can't love anything too much in this world. It's gone into the deepest deeps to wait another million years. Ah, the poor thing, waiting out there and waiting out there, while man comes and goes on this pitiful little planet. Waiting and waiting. I sat in my car, listening. I couldn't see the lighthouse or the light standing out in Lonesome Bay. I could only hear the horn, the horn, the horn. It sounded like the monster calling. I sat there wishing there was something I could say. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the Foghorn. I, well, I gotta say, I did thoroughly enjoy that one, although it really did sort of break my heart a little bit. Uh, kind of reminds me a bit of myself. Uh, you know, being what I am and who I am, wandering around, cleaning up people's uh, messes all day long, and, you know, having to worry about things like slipping in unsavory liquids and, uh, all the sawdust to go through. I mean, it is kind of a lonely job, so I get it. I mean, you know, there, there, there's there's a dinosaur somewhere inside me calling out to a lighthouse. Is there a dinosaur calling out for a lighthouse in you? Makes you think, don't it? Well, anyway, uh, that's about all I've got for today, so thanks so much for listening. Uh, I gotta get back to mopping. Uh, the men's room is, well, it's not pretty, let me tell you, so... I'm going to go do that. Uh, Y'all have a good Halloween now, and uh, I'll just 
Oh, wait, no, I can't go yet. I gotta turn this thing off. Hang on. Hang on. Let me just, uh... What the, where the heck's the button? I think that's it. Uh, uh, happy Halloween, everyone. Uh, uh, how the heck do you turn this to- Oh, for crying out loud, where's the off button? Such a tear-jerking tragedy. Rarely have I seen a monster so besieged by the cruel hands of fate. The rage of the lonely knows no bound. Yeah, yeah, boo flippin' who. I'm raging about my cousin getting arrested. Take it up with Judge Enma Dyer. <clears throat> if you enjoyed Ray's story, watch his best friend Ray Harryhausen's film, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which was inspired by it. The Redosaurus also attacks a lighthouse, but that's the only thing it has in common with this story. As one of my favorite humans once wrote, Sometimes you read a passage by a great writer, and you know what he says and how he says it will always be for you the only possible way it could be. Less often, a painter will describe an event in a way that fits into your interpretation of that event so perfectly that it becomes the event itself. The same is true of adapting literature to film. Hey there, sorry, hate to interrupt, but, uh... Someone wants to talk to you on the phone. Who? Vinny, it's your sister Amy. Kami, damn it, not you, Emma. Stop abusing your butler. Yokai aren't us Kami's slaves anymore. <laughs> yes, I. Butler, we will have words. Heh, <laughs> words, schmerds. I called a really good lawyer. You tell him, Joe. <sighs> Until next time, monster children, remember. Why you fear the dark. <laughs> the Kaiju Crypt, featuring... Damon Noyes as Vinny Kami, Daniel DeManna as Kappa Joe and the Old Janitor, Kim Lakanalau as Amy, edited by Nathan Marchand and Daniel DeManna, written, produced, and directed by Nathan Marchand. The Kaiju Crypt is a Moonlighting Ninjas Media production.